good thing into confused, organized, in close collaboration, Google institutions. A series for your working with additional culture, Gutenberg. Today we will be talking about diesel infrastructures. Engine organization, be online, and unfortunately, Yahoo also. Live and worship your invitation to the open source development, monetary in New York, and typically mind social. You must be on contemporary market. Lethal obligation. You feel at full and or little. You will become a kind of heir. Lethal obligation. You control freedom, power, paranoia and your intended network. So then, who is God? The power goes to companies' postscripts and fiscal structures frighten the textures dish. We experience these status quo revelations as they are dissolved and injected into everyone's favorite internet. The masters on stage will cost you the long-time infrastructure is in faith to remain visible. Yet when are you that you need your matter most? in relation to the market collapse, the cultural collapse, and the identity collapse. Everything is haunting itself in these circles where the most banal and fantastic figures, liminal figures of magic and death, of alien life and the personified unknowable, red circuits of discourse unmoored from their trajectories by capitalist algorithms. Welcome to the Lunch Bites Conference. So, hi again and welcome uh, to the Lunch Bites conference. This conference, as Johannes Ebert already pointed out, marks the conclusion of the European chapter of the Lunch Bites series that took place throughout 2014 in cooperation with the Goethe Institute and various partner institutions in seven cities. Amsterdam, Copenhagen, Glasgow, Dublin, Helsinki, London and Stockholm. It looks back on this European chapter and aims to reassess important questions uh, that have emerged during the past year. With this conference, however, a project that has been running since 2011 also comes to an end. I developed the Lunch Bites framework in 2010 for the Goethe Institute in Washington DC and the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. The goal was to set up a discussion series at lunchtime, hence the title, that would address the changes digital technologies have brought to the cultural field. Focusing mainly on the visual art, arts, each event was dedicated to a specific topic and to, at the intersection of art and digital culture and involved artists and experts from different fields who were invited to present their work and perspectives on the topic in question. We started to uh, organize events concretely in 2011 with titles such as copy culture, institutional challenges, digital material, and 
surveillance, security, and the net. After the first couple of events, the Swiss Art Funds Poelfezia also joined the project as a project partner. In addition, and with the help of the graphic designers uh, Katja Naima Schalcher and Hannes Glor, who are also uh, responsible for the um, graphic identity of the whole project, we developed an online exhibition platform to present works by emerging artists as part of the Lunch Bites website. Simply entitled Platform, it has featured works by the artists such as um, Carrie Altman, Amalia, U Amalia Ullmann, Megan Bruni, Paul Neal, whose performance we've just witnessed, Hannah Black, and Yuri Patterson. The works were specifically created for this online space and span a variety of different formats, such as videos, poems, online environments, photo collages, and essays. The most recent edition, uploaded last month, is a performance of an algorithm that shuffles through different websites, programmed by the London-based artist Anne de Bourg, who is uh, in the audience today as well. The Lunch Bite series in Washington, D.C. is documented in an anthology that will be released in May 2015 this year with the Dutch, Dutch publisher Onomatopoe and is entitled No Internet, No Art. Taking its title from a, a poem by the artists Pierre Lumino and Adam Cruces that is featured in the book, the title embodies one of the ontology's central premises, that in our present era, there can be no art that is not somehow connected to or reliant upon the internet. The contributions to the anthology either directly derive from the presentations that were part of the Lunch Bite series in Washington, D.C., or extrapolate from this format through a closer reflection on individual artistic practices and specific artworks. Furthermore, it includes 14 interviews with artists, curators, and academic experts, which were conducted two years after the series ended in 2014. These interviews were, were added to introduce, conceptualize, and further reflect on some of the key concepts and themes that are presented in the book. In 2013, I relocated to Amsterdam and I organized two Lunch Bites discussions as part of Art Basel Miami and Art Basel. The same year, together with Barbara Honrad, who's sitting in the audience today as well, then director of the Goethe Institute in Amsterdam, um, and Rotterdam, Goethe Institute in the Netherlands, now soon director of the Goethe Institute in Paris, I conceived of a new series of Lunch Bites events in alliance with the Goethe Institutes in the region Northwestern Europe. This allowed to bring in a wider field of artists and European experts and allowed me to introduce a more systematic approach as to, how to, uh, as to which themes could be tackled. Moreover, important aspects that Lunch Bites haven't had the chance to touch yet uh, could be addressed. What followed was a concept for a series of events that would take place in seven cities throughout 2014. We divided the years in four overarching themes corresponding with the seasons. Spring, medium, summer, structures and textures, fall, society, and winter, life. The idea was that in each city, in, can you hear me, by the way? Yeah, good. <laughs> the idea was that in each city, in collaboration with partner institutions, one event would be organized with a more specific topic that pertains to the overarching theme, resulting in a series of four Lunch Bites events per city. This initial concept eventually resulted in a, in a broad collaboration with 13 institutions generating 23 events in total. In Amsterdam, the Lunch Bites discussions were or organized with the Foam Photography Museum. In Copenhagen, with Nikolai Kunsthal and Gammelstrand. In Glasgow, with the Center for Contemporary Arts, CCA. In Helsinki, with Cine, Checkpoint Helsinki, Pixel Egg, and Frame Visual Arts Finland. In London, with the Institute of, of Contemporary Art, the ICA. 
the Digital Culture Unit of the Center for Visual Culture at Goldsmiths University and Arcadia Misa, and in Stockholm with the Royal Institute of Art and Fenster Kunstall. Compared to the series in Washington, the European edition thus extended over multiple cities and involved a variety of partners, thus creating an international network between individuals, representatives of the Goethe Institutes and art institutions. Still, the main idea behind the events remained the same. To select a topic relevant to the um, relevant um, to the intersecting fields of art and digital culture and to facilitate a discussion between artists and experts that would generate new thought about the topic. The question that remains to be asked then is, how has the field evolved and what is the current state of affairs now that this international project uh, comes to an end? This question, of course, will be addressed tonight and tomorrow through the various um, discussions and keynotes of this conference. For my part, I can, I can try to summarize the, tra the trajectory leading up to this point. In order to do so, I would like to consider the central ideas that have informed and shaped the outlook of the Lunch Bites series. Conceived in 2010, Lunchbite's concept is closely linked to a discourse that emerged around that time. In 2009, the new museum's first triennial, Younger Than Jesus, took place in New York. The artists featured in the exhibition moved seamlessly across media, according to one of its curators, Lauren Cornell, and also incorporated um, digital media. Yet, the show's curator didn't speak of the digital as a separate medium. Rather, they framed it as a cultural condition that could be addressed through all kinds of media. In doing so, the exhibition casually neglected a tradition that insisted on the medium specificity of work engaging with new media technology. Digital art had until then been predominantly uh, understood as defined by its technological characteristics rather than it reflecting a set of cultural and aesthetic values. Ignoring this conventional view, Younger Than Jesus thus unintentionally uh, set the stage for thinking about the relationship between digital technology and artistic production in different terms. Barely one year later, in 2010, the artist Arti Fierkant released his essay, The Image Object Post-Internet. In this short text, Fierkant introduced the term post-internet to describe a specific kind of contemporary artistic production dealing with the internet and digital technology, yet focusing neither exclusively on its te technological substrate, as new media art did in the eyes of the author, nor solely on the dissemination of an artwork, which would then be the realm of conceptual art. Post-internet at the time was a term meant to emphasize the increased flexibility and malleability that new media technologies have brought to the process of artistic production, which moved between digital and physical formats ever more smoothly. In addition, it pointed to the fact that these technologies became an everyday reality and as such integrated in the process of artistic practices in various stages. It was the implicit tension between new media and post-internet that initially triggered the concept for lunch bites. The aim was to approach the digital in a twofold manner, as a cultural condition that could be addressed beyond the confines of the digital medium, and as a technological structure with the potential to introduce new formats and a new vocabulary for artistic production. The aspect of medium specificity and the concept of the medium with regard to the digital remains a central concern in the field. As such, it was reflected in the first series of the last year's event, which was dedicated to the medium as an overarching theme. The first discussion tomorrow between between Meef Connolly, Katrina Slaus, and Ben Rickers, moderated by Toki Ligeberg, we look back on this first theme and reassess the most important points uh, of the discussions last year.
Considering how the field has evolved since 2010, perhaps the most obvious observation um, is that the so-called post-internet art at one point became fashionable. Initially discussed primarily by a few New York-based curators and artists, Vierkant referred particularly to Marisa Olsen, as well as Jean McHugh's uh, blog, Post Internet. Internet-related art was brought up more and more, mostly in reference to the post-internet phenomenon. Attention peaked when Claire Bishop's article, The Digital Divide, appeared in the fall 2012 Art Forum issue. Neglecting, or perhaps being unaware, of recent developments, Bishop claimed that digital art was disconnected from the art world and that essentially only very few artists who were part of the mainstream art world critically reflected on our digital condition. Ironically, the polemic appeared at a point in time when internet-related art was attracting increasing attention and so-called new media art started to make inroads in the blue chip art world in the wake of the emerging debate around post-internet. Over the next two years, the, internet in, in, the interest in internet-related art grew significantly, culminating in 2014. This was the year in which the term art flipping entered common parlance and post-internet was discovered as a marketable label. Art flipping, for, for those of you unfamiliar with the term, describes a way to buy art to make a quick profit only, usually by buying art from young artists whose value is expected to increase and then, as soon as this has happened, sell the artwork again. Both developments, post-internet and art flipping, can be seen as symptoms of an art market whose rate of commodification has been accelerated by the implementation of social media platform, as seen, for instance, in uh, the use of Instagram by the prominent art collector Stefan Simkowitz, art auctioneer Simon de Bury, but also curators such as Klaus Biesenbach. Placed squarely in the mainstream art world, post-internet this became an emerging trend with the promise of a steep profit. Unsurprisingly, this market success also correlated with a growing number of panel discussions, exhibitions, articles, and publications on the topic. Lunch Bites, this has become part of a growing field of different formats dedicated to the question how the internet and digital technologies have become embedded in artistic production. At the same time, the post-internet discussion somehow reached an impasse. While pointing to an important phenomenon, it also continued to circle around the same questions. Who invented the term? Which artist should it be attributed to? Is it a hype, a trend, or a lasting thing? Do these artists really have any, anything to say, or is it just about attractive, photoshopped, savvy pictures? With Lunch Bites, I try to break this impasse and steer away from these questions. The concerns of post-internet, which anticipated the ubiquity of digital technologies, are still of vital concern. Adding depth and scope to these concerns, however, the aim of Lunch Bites was to place them in a broader social-historical perspective. The goal was to open up the often very narrowly defined discursive field of post-internet by examining artistic practices thematically within the larger context of digital culture. Moreover, what I have aimed for was to include a wider scope of artists who are generally not associated with post-internet. Nevertheless, post-internet should be acknowledged as a phenomenon that was able to launch a wider public discussion about the merits of internet-related art, even if eventually it turned out to be conceptually limited. The growing importance of the digital within uh, the visual arts, illustrated by the post-internet phenomenon, obviously correlates to the fact that digital technologies have become more pervasive in general. Initially, many concepts and topics that surfaced in the emerging field of, art, of digital art were discussed in largely binary terms. The supposed free online space for artistic production was contrasted with the confines of the traditional art world. 
the immaterial quality of websites, software, and code was opposed to the material physical states of sculptures and paintings. The browser was positioned against the gallery, while open source culture was seen as a movement against the forces of the capitalist market. The demarcation of a new field apparently required constructing such rigid divisions. But as the discourse has evolved in tandem with our computational infrastructures, which have now become ubiquitous, these stark contrasts have blurred into more ambiguous tones. We are realizing that we are part of a hybrid reality constituted by architectures at once physical and digital. How this materiality can be understood and how information and artwork circulate through digital and physical infrastructure is the topic uh, of the second panel tomorrow, entitled Structures and Textures. It will start at 11.45 and will feature Kerstin Stakelmeier, Dietrich Diedrichsen, and Christopher Colendron Thomas as panelists, and will be moderated by Victoria Kembling and Carson Chen. Moreover, it has become clear that the utopian aspirations attached to network technologies have not materialized to the degree many hoped for. On a political level, most of the revolutions partially fa facilitated by digital technologies did not bring lasting change. The internet has, very few exceptions aside, not turned into a space where knowledge is exchanged freely. Network technologies has, have thus far also failed to revolutionize the institutional system of the art world. And most artists do not work with dig digital technologies in an exclusive manner that would establish digital art as, new, as a new autonomous artistic genre or practice. If one wants to assess the impact digital culture has had on artistic practice and the art world more generally, it will have to be done in a tone decidedly less grand than even a couple of years ago. To be sure, I do not want to diminish the importance and the merit of recent artistic production that has been facilitated, co-authored and inspired by digital technologies. Over the past years, we have seen the emergence of artist group whose members found each other online and collectively defined a set of tropes and visual languages unique to the vernacular web of a specific time. And in my view, some of the most exciting and thought-provoking art touches on questions related to contemporary digital culture. Still, the reality is that cap ca uh, capital commodity culture has um, enveloped and appropriated most of the web. Making use of these structures now implies different forms of critiques than 10 years ago. How modes of critiques and acts of resistance can be formulated in artistic production today is the topic of the third panel tomorrow. Uh, it will start at two o'clock and will involve uh, the, the two artists, Stefan Dillemuth and Constant Dullard, and will be moderated by Christopher Gansing. Digital technologies does no longer figure as a next frontier. Instead, they operate squarely in our midst friendly, functional and clean, yet at the same time hiding complex structures behind their surfaces and interfaces. As a result, there is an increasing dependence on the abstract processes that enable and constrain our mundane activities, from communicating with friends to finding a restaurant, a partner, a job. Social interactions have acquired an exchange value that can be measured in likes, thereby becoming a form of social capital that ultimately has the potential to result in a paycheck. Never have the logic of late capitalism been incorporated so intimately into our daily lives. How this intimate relation with technology and ultimately capitalism connects to our structure of feeling, the way we relate to others and conceive of our identities is the focus of tomorrow's last panel. Elusively entitled Life, it starts at 3.45 and involves Cornelia Solfrank, Jesse Darling, and Cecile B. Evans. Elvia Wilk will moderate this talk, and since I know it's your birthday, Elvia, happy birthday. Thank you. 
Reflecting on these themes are crucial when trying to come to terms with today's digitized society and its artistic production, the conference day tomorrow will thus follow the structure of last year's events by returning to the overarching themes I have selected for the European series. In addition to these panels, we have invited two keynote speakers, Professor David Schoslit, whose computer I'm using, and Milesia Gronlund. David Schoslit will address the question of how the current extraterritorial structure of information, the cloud, can figure as a critical space for artists today, whereas Melissa Grundlund will consider how post-internet art relates to its precursors, such as net art and new media art. Both keynotes will thus address uh, concerns that were and continue to be of key importance to the project. The conference bill will be concluded um, by uh, a closing discussion which will be held at 6.15 tomorrow. Moreover, the conference is further framed by three performances of which you have experienced one just before my introduction, Paul Niels. Um, besides Paul Niels, Jena Sutila and Ilya Karilampi will also perform tonight. All of them will performative, performatively deal in different ways with the lunch bites discussions they were part of. Before I hand it over to Jena Sutila, I would like to thank the many people who made this project possible. First, I would like to, to thank the Goethe Institute especially Barbara Honrath and the Goethe Institute directors involved uh, in the series last year. Secondly, I would like to thank the partnering institutions and the individuals whom I had the pleasure to work with. Many of them are here tonight. Please bear with me, this is a rather long list. Kim Knoppels from Film Photography Museum Amsterdam, Sophie Byrne and Helen O'Donaghy from the Irish Museum of Modern Art, Remco de Bly and Alex, Alex Misik from CCA in Glasgow. Markus Aström from Cine Helsinki, Kimo Modig, a freelance curator in Helsinki, Taru Elfing from Frame Visual Art Finland, Andrew Patterson and Nat Natalie Uber from Pixel Lake, and Tina Erkintalo from Checkpoint Helsinki. Matthew Fuller from the Goldsmiths University, Tom Clark and Rosha Farkas from Arcadia Misa, and Rosalie Duval from the ICA. Donatella Bernardi from the Royal Institute of Art in Stockholm and Maria Lind from Tensta Kunsthal. Then I would like to thank the staff at the HKW, its director, uh, Bernd Scherer, for hosting this conference, Alexandra Engel, who is in charge of the whole um, very complicated production, and of course the technical team who is doing an amazing job. I would also like to thank Charlotte, um, Charlotte Chas, Nora Wolfeil, and Isabel Duisted for their help during the conference, and Freya Wilk for assisting throughout the project. Most of all, I would like to thank Stella Rick. I am very grateful for having had such an intelligent, thorough, and practical assistant on my side, who has always been ready to help in a most productive, uncomplicated, uncom and assertive way. Then I would, uh, would like to thank Hannes Glor and Lani Marschalchum, the graphic designers who developed the graphic identity of the whole project. All of the flyers, the handouts, posters, and the booklet of the European series, as well as the website, were designed by them. I know that Lunch Bites would have never appealed to so many people without their creative input. Also, I would like to thank Niels van Doren for his advice, input, and presence in general. Last but not least, I would like to thank all of the conference participants. A special thank you also to the artists whose performances we will experience tonight. Ilya Kralampi, Jena Sutela, and Paul Niel. Then, one additional remark. After the uh, keynote and the closing performance by Ilya, there will be a reception just outside the auditorium. Thank you for your attention.